Come on, guys. I was already in here. It started recording. I got that. That's the dog. Is it running? Yeah. Good. Okay. So I just gave you the formula sheet. Uh, keep this with you. Bring it with you to every class because we'll go through them all one by one. By the end of the semester, you'll be able to use all of these formulas and also put, guys, also put all the tables here that you need to use for the formulas. Uh, if, you talk, if you take a look at the IVR book, the formulas are all over the place, so it's really hard to know how to get through the book. But uh, this puts it all together. And in the book, you'll see it coming, uh, coming through all the chapters. But uh, again, they're all summarized in here. And if there is a missing formula, we'll put it in there. So we'll go through them one by one. And uh, you can bring this to you with you in the exam or quizzes, or take it with you if you're going to get a job in design. Uh, a lot of utility companies now are hiring energy auditors, so they will hire somebody who will go to people's houses and tell them, by the way, your house required this, has this much loss, and uh, you will save this much money if you do weatherization, if you improve the house. I know Eversource does that, and it's for free, but they need people like you to go there and perform a blower door testing. They give you the equipment, they give you caulking, they give you measurement, and you'll go with an iPad, probably a computer, and do a heat loss analysis and say, you can save this much by adding insulation to your house. And uh, there's a lot of subsidies for that. And there's a lot of, uh, what they call, uh, rebates if you buy insulation. So they want <coughs> that it's good for you and it's good for them. The more energy you use, the more they will have high demand, so it's, it's better for you to insulate your house. So there are a lot of jobs in that uh, area. Uh, if anybody's still interested in taking the heat analyst exam, please let me know. That will show that whatever employer you get to interview with, that you know how to do heat loss analysis. Go ahead. Um, kind of a little bit off topic, but yeah. um, for Eversource, what, yeah. is, what, what does um, Eversource offer with like HVAC jobs? Do they offer an HVAC job? They do energy auditing. Energy auditing? Yeah. Uh, uh, and probably they do a lot of uh, maybe power generation, I'm not sure. Uh, field services. So probably you, you can get a job with that, this kind of background. But I know energy auditing is a big thing nowadays because it's becoming the law in many towns. So they will send you uh, with a team and you can go do the calculation and it's part of, the, part of your job. Uh, so if you, if you want, again, for those who did not take the hit load analysis exam, I uh, still offer it. Just let me know when are you free, when you want to take it. I can set you up with a computer to do it. Uh, but uh, we'll start this course. Uh, and the goal is that the, at the end of the course you can be very proficient in uh, doing heat load or cooling load calculations and laying out the systems, knowing the system components. Uh, and you can be able to design and do a layout on paper. Uh, probably you have some skills to do this stuff as hands-on. Uh, with some training probably you'll be able to uh, work in the field of energy auditing. Uh, it also will be helpful if you work as an apprentice somewhere. We have a good uh, uh, apprentice and co-op and uh, internship program. So try to work with that, Mr. Livy, and probably he'll <coughs> set you up with something like that to give you a good background. Question? Is there an exam for this for advanced? Similar exam? Yeah, that's it. No, no, it's, that's, it's Same different. Thing. Yeah, Same one. <coughs> okay. Uh, so, We'll talk about, uh, probably we brushed over this stuff, guys. We brushed over this stuff last semester. We'll repeat some of those uh, key elements. Understanding heat requirement. Why do we need heat in the house? I mean, we know why we need heat, but how much heat do we need? Where do we put it? How much is too much? How much is too little? And why do we need the right amount of heat? <coughs> uh, options. We have plenty of options. Uh, what are our options and why some of them work and why some of them do not work? Why do we use gas instead of uh, oil? Why do we use a heat pump? We can we use a wood stove? Uh, can we use two systems instead of one? All these questions we can answer with some kind of uh, uh, aware knowledge. Uh, heat transfer concepts and calculations. Again, we do not need to go to the nitty gritty science of uh, heat transfer. We just need to understand that if we make heat in the basement, how do we transfer that heat from the basement to the house and how we distribute that heat? 
And if we lose a lot of heat, we have to know why. If you're burning 200 BTUs an hour in the basement, you're getting only 50, you gotta find the reason why. And if without the knowledge of how heat leaks, how does it escape, how does it transfer, it's hard to pinpoint the problem. But I'm sure by now, I'm confident by now that uh, you have a general idea. We keep honing on the, those ideas. Uh, equipment sizing calculation. So we did sizing for a boiler, right? Who can size a boiler now for a house? Hopefully everybody. <laughs> Hopefully everybody. Depends if we did it right or not. I think everybody did it all correctly. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't get a grade for the project. So we did that. Did the heat loss for every room? You added 15% for the bathrooms and bedrooms, and you added all the rooms together, and then you add 15% for cold startup, and that's your boiler. That's your heat load. Doesn't have to be a boiler, but this is how much heat you need. How do you get it there? How do you make it? That's up to you to decide and up to the owner. Now watch actually what is actually available. For gas, if you're in a city where they have gas line, it's better to use gas. Uh, sometimes oil is an option. And sometimes you just want to use a heat pump. And heat pumps have came a long way for houses. So equipment sizing calculations. So we did the boiler. What about the question? Do you have those papers back as an example? For the yeah. Project, yeah, I'll give it to you, but I'll give it to that. So, what other equipment involved in the heating system? So we, the first part, we just estimate how much the house needs. And we know how much each room needs. <coughs> what do we need to put in each room to provide that heat supply? So if we are using hot water, what do you need to put in the room? Radiators. Radiators, baseboard radiators. If you're using steam, you need mattresses, radiators. If you're using forced air, what are you gonna need? Air conditioning. Duct system Venting. and those little registers here and diffusers. So, and those also has to be sized. Otherwise, you can get 60,000 BTUs in the basement and the first room will get 70 and the other ones will not be adequately heated. So you need to know how to distribute that uh, system. To Transfer the heat from the basement to the house, the living space. What kind of uh, heat transfer mode we will use? We'll use convection. Convection uses what kind of material? Fluids or solids? Fluids. What kind of fluid do you use? We have three types. Either air, and that's first air. Water. Water can also be steam. Or you can use glyco. For what? Glyco. Antifreeze. Oh, right. Okay. So antifreeze is a mix, and uh, it's a little bit more expensive than water, but uh, it has a lot of advantages for, <coughs> as we saw in January, when the, when the temperature dropped really sharp, a lot of people had freezing problems. And that's a big issue, and there's a lot of money to fix. So there are a lot of ways to counteract the freezing issues. However, uh, people do not put antifreeze, and uh, people don't anticipate the cold. So we, there are some tricks we can do to uh, counteract the freezing. One of them is just leave the water running a little bit, uh, have the pipe be clean, and also keep the temperature up to 50 at least, so it will not be uh, too cold for the water to freeze. Uh, freezing pipe is annoying because you have to cut out the pipe or change it if it bursts. Or you can, uh, or you have, they have systems now where you can use it, it's like a welder, where you run the electricity through it and it should melt. But again, it's a, it's a big issue. You have to go through the wall, the pipes that are in the wall, so you have to go find the two ends of the wall. It's a, it's a big issue. <laughs> it's better just to prevent that, just like a heart attack or uh, when you, instead of having a bypass, it's better just to have a preventive thing and just not get a heart attack or clot in your body, in your arteries. It's a block, so. It's, it's tough to work with. So equipment sizing, we learn about equipment sizing and how much heat, and we want uniform temperature for the same reason, because if we have a 60,000 BTU and it's not being distributed adequately throughout the house or equally, you'll have some cold parts and hot parts, and those cold parts, <coughs> even though the heat is on, it's not going to heat enough, so in a day when it's really cold, it will freeze, and that will cause some problems, and probably it will plug your system, and the entire house will freeze, so this is some of the problems that you can have even in a new house because you did not design it very well. 
And having this awareness will enable you to go and with uh, an aware eye and look at the system and see if something is adequate or not. We'll go into some small components of the system and how they are designed from your point of view as a technician. I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, science behind it, but I might explain it if you want to understand it. But at least you will know what and what basis do we choose a pump. So when you go to a house when it's not getting enough pumping, you can roughly do back of the envelope calculation. Okay, this pump is not does not have enough head. That's why it's not pumping up to the second floor. That's why you're not having enough heat. So, and uh, these are valuable information for for you as a technician because it will help you pinpoint the problem and uh, eventually have a solution for that. And if you're going to design, probably they will have you working with somebody who designed so many houses, and you will gain more experience. With, uh, with that. Um, and again, also, it will enable you to double check numbers and double check installation. You don't always assume that people know what they're doing. Yeah, you can always double check. Sometimes a mistake keeps happening over and over and over again because people do not double check and people just assume, okay, John did it correctly. I'm sure he did it so many times, he, it's okay. No, I at least question what's, uh, uh, how the calculation has been made. And sometimes, uh, knowing what is the basis for selection will enable you to question numbers. So, if, for example, if I if I send you to a house and it has two stories and you see the pump head is six feet, right off the bat you will think, okay, six feet head. The house is two stories. Each story is eight feet high, sixteen. So this is not gonna work at all. It's not magic. It's not voodoo. It's not gonna work. That's uh, right off the bat. Uh, or again, same example. Houses with two stories, eight feet each, and we have two pumps with six feet head each, and it, uh, and they put one in each floor. Still not pumping enough. There's a lot of losses, and you also think about did you consider the losses in the pipe? Now we just measured the house, so there are losses in the pipe for friction. So you have to consider. Uh, do we want? 40 feet head, uh, that, that should cover it. They just overshoot it. That should cover it, you know? Not necessarily. And again, we want to have a system that is performing with the, with the least invasion to the living space. Um, you don't want to hear the water swishing every time the radiator turns on, the heat turns on. That's really annoying, that's a bad design. So try to... Installation. Yeah, it's, and uh, also it has to do with the velocity of the water in the pipe. If it's too fast, you will hear it, and it might not give enough heat. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, basic residential heating design layout. So probably now you'll have the, the eye to go into somebody's basement or like in your house and look and tell what kind of design is that. Is that a one pipe design? Is it in series? Is it in parallel? Uh, what are those components? Uh, what is this big drum that looks like a hang drum out of the pipe, that's the expansion tank, where the pump is, where is the Hartford loop, all these things. Um, again, by the end of the class, you'll be able to recognize those components and also their absence. Do they have it, do they not have it, and why? Uh, we'll spend like at least one or two classes just to do a calculation for the thermal expansion tank, which is uh, basically a drum that will take the excess water. Why do we have excess water in the system? Because water expands. What happens if things expand and there is no room to expand? They will leak. They will spill. Uh, we'll talk about the recent advancement and areas of improvement. Of course, the systems are not perfect. There is always area of improvement. And that's, this is very, very valuable to you as an, a business idea, as an improvement, as a uh, bringing something new to the business, to the, to the industry. I know a few students graduated from here in this program 15 years ago and they have their own businesses now with uh, small uh, manufacturing ideas. Some of them design filters for condensing boilers. Some of them design different kind of uh, air distribution system. And it's very, very simple ideas that can improve the system a lot. But uh, again, people always have the resistance of change. Okay, system is running, let's not, let's not question it. So there's always area of improvement, and you know, if you know what is the reason behind putting all these components together, 
you can say, hey, I can do without that. I can improve this part. I can find new technology and put it into the system that saves money and make the system easier for you to install. For example, the PEX, the, the pipes, that's a new invention relatively. I think it's only in the last eight years where it saved a lot of money, saved a lot of uh, cost, and it made the installation very, very convenient. And there's a lot of those ideas. And again, people just do not like to use them because for some reasons, uh, sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes it's, uh, they just don't want to change what they're doing, and they're familiar with uh, the equipment they have. Uh, okay, this is a small intro for hydronic heating. Again, hydronic is, uh, Anything has water in it, hydro, hydration. Uh, so the first heat in a house came with steam. And there's still some systems that use steam. They pump steam to the room to heat it. Steam has a lot of heat. Uh, however, if you pump steam into the room for a long time, what would happen? Eventually. You get mold. You get mold, it gets moist. Uh, it's not very pleasant, but this is the first heating in the house, pumping steam into the room. And uh, also back in the days when they used to have like houses, uh, I mean huts or small cabins, they will have a fire, but the fire is not distributing heat as much the entire room. So what do they do? They put a pot of water on top of the fire for steam, distribute heat faster than just convection air. So that's another way to, they realize that steam actually carries a lot of heat and moves faster, and expands faster. So steam was the beginning. Uh, vacuum pumps, after the steam power has been realized, people start with this, with the vacuum pump. The vacuum pump looks something like a combustion engine, internal combustion engine, which is cylinder. That's inside it. It's pissed in inside a cylinder, and it's get pushed. Seriously? Oh, damn. So it's like a reciprocating pump. And if we pump some steam in here, if you heat steam and pump it into cylinder, that will drive the piston up and down. It's the same way when you do combustion of gas inside the cylinder. It will burn, explode, push the piston out and back again. And that was the beginning of the idea. We can make a driving force out of steam. Uh, and we, they use that for trains. And trains <coughs> use steam for a long time, ships. And it has a lot of power. And, and until this day, we use steam power to generate electricity. Since the, for like, since the 50s or 40s, it's still like steam is used to generate electricity. With the same concept. An engine that is dri driven by steam, and the steam turns a turbine, and the turbine turns a generator, and the generator is uh, <coughs> making electricity. <coughs> so that's James Watt, space heating. They used the direct steam to a room. It was effective for a while. It's still, you can still use it, but it has problems with condensation, distribution, and also control. So you turn it off when it's too hot, then you turn it on, it's a lot of fluctuation back and forth. And until the 1820, they thought, okay, why don't we just direct the steam into tubes? And those tubes will radiate heat into the room. And it was just tubes. <clears throat> they didn't think a lot about putting fins on them. But the tubes were effective enough. And that uh, was the beginning of the steam mattresses. But until this day, we have steam mattresses. But it's called the mattress, mattress because it looks like a, a mattress. The, the steam will go through it and lose heat through the pipes and the air will heat the room. Uh, it, usually steam mattresses do not have a lot of fins in it because they have a lot of heat and you want to balance the heat. So steam usually is going to be around 220, 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you want to put a lot of fins, otherwise it's going to be too hot too quickly. You want it to seep and radiate to the room because of uh, the large temperature difference. In the hot water systems, with the radiator, we have fins, right? Because the water is at 140, 180 degrees, not too hot. So the heat coming out of the fins is 
hot enough to balance uh, and heat the room. If we have failed on the steam, there will be a lot of heat from the room quickly, and it will be very uncomfortable. Uh, so steam and gold, they have the first self-regulating boiler and a practical radiator design the mattress, where you have, instead of tubes on top of each other, we have mattress that's very efficient when it comes to the size. You don't want a very huge distributor, they want something efficient. And they came with the idea of uh, the venting and the one pipe steam. So we just need to pump steam from the same pipe and it will come back as water. It's a very, very smart idea. And uh, we'll talk about that in the steam chapter. So we have our steam coming from here, going to the steam. Steam coming from one pipe. What's initially in the mattress when it's empty? Uh, air. Air. So the steam comes in there, and the steam has to displace the air. So steams start to fill in, and the air will comes out from the vent. And that's when you hear the hissing noise. And steam is heavier than air, correct? It has more displacement, more pressure. So it will come out, the air will be displaced, and you hear the hissing noise. The, the valve is designed to close at the rate of the steam. Once the steam completely fills the mattress, the valve will close. It's just a mechanical device. So now we fill the, the mattress with steam, this will close, and the, the whole system is completely Mechanical. Uh, as the steam heats the, the the mattress in the middle, usually the middle is very thick, and that's the point. It will absorb a lot of heat from the steam. What happens to the steam when it, do, when it loses heat? Turns into water. Turns into water. It starts to condense. So eventually it will lose water, and we'll have condensation. I will start having water over here. And since the water is heavier than steam, it will be at the bottom. And eventually, it will go in the same pipe all the way back to the boiler. That was a very sophisticated design. And uh, it has to be designed correctly, otherwise you have some issues. If you don't, think about the process. You have to displace the air first. If you don't displace the air, you're not going to get steam. The system is not working. If you don't get rid of the water, system will not be able to put in more steam. The pipe will be clogged, you have to be water here, and there's no more steam coming. It's not going to work. That's why you see steam pipes are very thick, to have enough water, enough uh, room for the water to seep in, and the steam to come out. If the, if the pipe is not pitched correctly, what will happen? It yeah, it, it will go back, but what will happen? Remember when we, last semester we had the big bags here, hammering. If you don't pitch the water very quickly and you have too much water over there, and steam is very fast. You have very fast steam, and if you keep some water, it will cram a little bit and it will bang, and you have water handling. Kind of like a miniature car crash. In a, in a way, no. yes. Uh, so steam is not still uh, available in, uh, in a lot of houses, but uh, if you go to houses built before the 60s, probably you'll find steam. Uh, my house has steam, it was built in 1920. It's, it does work okay, it's not that bad, but uh, people want hot water more than steam for many reasons. We'll talk about that actually again, but uh, why? What would you think? Why do you want water and not steam? Cheaper? Safer. It's cheaper, it's safer. You don't have to overheat the water. The water is at boiling cost, temperature. It costs uh, less money. The, Matches that are more uh, are less expensive. Uh, radi radiators are, exp are, are cheaper. Uh, steam mats are very expensive. It has a lot of metal. It's very heavy. It's bulky. Uh, the mattresses are very big and they take a lot of space. So it's like a piece of equipment, a piece of furniture in your house. So it's really huge. 
it does put out a lot of uh, heat, but again, it's huge. Uh, safety again, and in some way, it's more efficient. Why? Startup. You don't have to heat the water from from 50 all the way to 220 every time you want heat. So you can go up to 180, and uh, that's it. If you use radiant floor heating, which is the best system ever made so far, uh, in my opinion, it's really great, especially for new houses. You only have to raise the temperature of the water to 80, 85, and that's it. So imagine the efficiency. You might lose some uh, efficiency when it comes to pumping, but you don't have to go all the way to 120. 80, 85 is enough temperature that you pump through the pipes, and that's it. So again, that will save you a lot of money. Question? Yeah, radiant heat is great because um, I have that at my house. But I also have, like, my secondary is I have these yeah. wall that's, units. That's that is actually, a lot of people do that because radiant heat is okay, it's good, but sometimes when it's too cold and you don't have to, you need to overcompensate for that. That's the 15% that's the, the we added. And one of the drawbacks for radiant heating is it takes too long to heat up few hours at least to go to right here. But if you, once you reach the temperature, it's a good way to maintain. Question? Uh, well, it's a statement about uh, about radiant floor. You also can't heat the water too much. So there's, yeah. a, there's a certain there's a limit. Yeah. limit to how Because high you, you'll be stepping on the floor. You're hitting the floor, so you don't want to be too hot to burn you. Guys? So, uh, Stephen Goldstein is the founder of H.B. Uh, Smith, which is in here in Springfield. And we have one still in business till this day, and they make boilers, and one of the best boilers around. Very efficient, very concise, and very uh, reliable. So why did we start with steam and water in the beginning? Why had my temperature? Keep guessing. Accidentally? No. <laughs> Come on. Why did we start heating first with steam and not water? Why, how come so nobody has to? It's already hot water. Temperature? No. More complicated? No. no. We didn't have pumps before. Yes. We did not have pumps back then. Oh. The pump was not invented until 1920. So, easier uh, pump, uh, steam, you don't have to pump it. It will go to the lower pressure. With hot water, you have to pump it. So, that oh. was the introduction of the pump. Uh, it's going to the beginning, I think, in 1918 or something like that. And uh, water was used in heating systems, and the hydraulic steam started, uh, which is, again, hydraulic also includes steam, but now we start with a hydraulic system that has hot water in it. And again, it was uh, less expensive because you have to design a boiler that only goes to 180 or 200. You don't have to make a really huge thick boiler that has to be uh, very well designed, I mean, over designed to compensate for the steam pressure. And uh, there was a lot of, there's a lot of issues for uh, steam boilers explosions until this day. That's why they have fireplaces and pumps instead of burners. Yeah, so if you have uh, steam, there's always, you have power plants being, have explosions and always because steam, uh, you overheat the boiler and there's not enough water or too much pressure. Uh, so it's always going to be an issue. So water was safer. It, it was less expensive to put in your house. And uh, it did the job perfectly with uh, less cost and less uh, issues. Uh, electrical controls were added to the system. And that, something, that is something we have to understand. What are the controls we need? Mr. If somebody there shoveling coal into the, the boiler or somebody is turning on or off the, the boiler, we can have controls. And the invention of electricity and relays, we, we realized we can have the boiler run itself. And it was a great idea. Hey, it's running itself. I don't have to like hire somebody to do the boiler, or I don't have to go turn it on and off by hand. It became more comfortable. And also that uh, facilitated us having less cycling. So probably before the controls, you will turn on your boiler and hit the house to 90 before you sleep. So by the midnight, it will be around 70. So you have to turn it on and off by hand. Uh, the, having electrical control, of course, it started with the, with the thermostat. 
not even the thermostat, the bimetal, which is still in use until this day. The bimetal helical thermostat or controls that tells you, okay, we have enough water, enough hot water, turn on the boiler, etc. And uh, that's a course by itself, but we're doing these combustion control circuits. We'll talk about those controls and how do they function. They're not that complicated, but they went too uh, very far by now and they are very, very uh, sophisticated. Now you can like, monitor your boiler function from your phone or your, if you have a NIST thermostat or Honeywell wireless thermostat, you can see, you can turn on and off the uh, boiler at your home and monitor the temperature. And again, that saves you a lot of money. Why you don't need to keep your house at 65 when you're not there. You can let it be at 50 before you go to home. The system is very efficient within half an hour. You can get the heat and turn that on. And eventually that over time that will save you a lot of money. Uh, Pathing had a lot of advances. Again, we said uh, where did the uh, word plumbing came from? Was it called plumber or plumbing? Come on. Harry Plummer. <laughs> uh, the word plum comes from uh, the Latin or Greek uh, word. I think it's a Greek word for uh, lead. Yeah, PV, that's lead. And uh, they used to make pipes out of lead because it's soft. Lead is toxic. It's not good, it's expensive. Uh, it kept advancing little by little. We have the galvanized steel, which is good, efficient, still heavy. Uh, not a lot of good, not, not good conductivity, and trust over time. We still have more and more advancement. Uh, the, the recent and most efficient, uh, I say efficient and economical is the PEX, which is uh, PVC or some kind of rubber. Uh, it has, I think, uh, polyethylene with some kind of Teflon lining, but it's very cheap and very convenient. And again, the cost of piping has a lot to do with the material and installation cost. So the more you can save in that, the more uh, economical the system is. But at the end, we still need copper for the radiators. Why? Conductivity. <clears throat> Conductivity. You want some material that will absorb all the heat and give it off to that space. And you want the opposite when you try to transfer the heat from the boiler to the roof. So PEX will be very efficient because it's uh, rubber or plastic based or polymer based. Yeah, so it, it will not conduct as much. So you, you, you want to transfer that all the way to the to the uh, room. Then you can radiate that into, into uh, uh, brass or copper than aluminum. So piping has advanced a lot and made the systems very, very efficient. So radiators, they came from uh, new shapes, new materials, and lower cost. I have a radiator here, just a bunch of them. So this is a standard radiator very simple design, as you can tell. Usually, cold air will be at the bottom, right? So, the mechanism here is... <laughs> so, if you look at the radiator, the water will go through it. What do we see here? Fins. Those fins, if you look inside, they are connected with a ring to the pipe. So they absorb some heat and the heat dissipate all the way to the edges. Uh, so the fins usually are lined vertically and hot air will rise. So you have natural convection and eventually. So what do the fins do exactly? The fins have more surface area to distribute the heat. So the pipe is going to be hotter than the fins. The middle of the fin will be hotter than the tip of the fin. So Will the room get hotter if you have the fins, or if you don't have them? It, it will, because it'll be able to convey that heat faster. Yeah, so basically it's just a more heat transfer service, that's right. So, so let's say you have a room that's getting way too hot when you heat it up, and they have the fins. You took the fins off, and it was good. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or some of them have a double double row of uh, fins. If you, have, if you don't have enough space in the room to put uh, a radiator, and we'll see how this calculation is done. 
it's per foot. Every foot will radiate a certain amount of heat. If you don't have enough room, let's say you have only two, two feet, you can put two rows of heat, of, uh, of fins in it, a radiator, and it will give off some, some heat. So this design has, uh, been changed, has not been changed for a long time, but they have some kind of uh, finesse to it, like more slots, more rows. Different materials. Different materials, of course. Uh, I think they stick with the steel for the base, and uh, the fins are still aluminum because it's cheaper and more malleable, and uh, it does the job. And the tubes are copper. mostly mostly copper. Yeah. You want copper tubes. And uh, this is a three quarter of an inch, which is the most common, and you can find them in half an inch. And we will we'll see how that plays into the distribution of heat. And uh, some of the problems and uh, issues, I'm gonna keep repeating that, is uh, those need to be cleaned once in a while. You can tell they collect a lot of dust and animal hair. Uh -huh. If they collect dust and hair, what will happen? It reduces it's their surface area. No surface area, no flow. The airflow is less. And you're depending on that airflow. Actually, if you have an infrared camera, you'll see the air coming from the bottom and going up. So you want to, to, to vacuum things once in a while and clean them. Uh, mostly vacuum, I think it's a very sharp and annoying to wipe, so you have to clean them with that. Unless you have some kind of brush. Uh, I don't know what brush is, because you, you also don't want to bend them too much. Yeah. You don't want to bend too much. They're also very sharp. There's a tool made to yeah. clean those. Lizard? Oh, yeah, but yeah, there is a tool made to clean them with all down a shop back. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a shop back. Who wants a shop back? I do. I have two. Oh, of course you do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love chef. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to start it. Because they're, they're cheap. Yeah. How are you going to clean out your basement with the plug? How you going to clean your car? That's how. I, I get them for like five minutes. They look like an apartment. 30 yeah, bucks. It cleans everything. It's very efficient. It takes water. You buy a regular vacuum for like two hundred dollars. A shaft vacuum is like, it's, it's, and it's stronger. It's, it has the amount, the right amount of suction, as they say. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, you can, but uh, huh? No, no, no. Guys, listen up. You can use that from the from the boiler to the radiator because it doesn't lose as much heat. But if you put a plastic pipe, pipe and hoping that it will lose a lot of heat, it's not going to. It's not a good way to, to disturb it. It's a good insulator, which means it doesn't give up a lot of heat. You, what you want is a conductor, which is like copper. Copper is a conductor. It will give up that heat. Yeah, my problem is like at home, they've got really small rooms. they got the heat going around the whole room with the copper. If you replace part of that with plastic, you're dead. Yeah. Until it gets no. radiators, yeah. Yeah. Is there still going to want the radiators? Okay. Say okay. that again? Would it be easier to just insulate the pipe in that situation? Yeah. If yeah. it doesn't have the fence? Yeah, if you don't have yeah. yeah. just put pipe inside. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's just a foam thing you wrap around the pipe. Let's move on. Let me distract you. Fuel. Fuel for heat. We talked about that a lot before. We. Uh, I just want to give you a concept of what fuel uh, energy is. So coal, it's 55,000 BTU per pound, <laughs> which is uh, not bad at all, considering the price, it's not that expensive. Uh, the problem with coal, if you have it for a building, is shut down and turn and start up again. So once we start like uh, messing out with uh, boilers, you'll see how starting up and restarting is a very big, important topic. So with coal, shutting down is going to be an issue because you have to stop the air, and starting up is usually another issue. It does not start as quickly, so that's another problem with the, with the you really hot, cycle. Hot yeah. Heat. yeah, slow start up and shut down. So they used to, guys, so they used to like just like uh, eyeball the amount of cold until it burns out, and it gets a little bit too hot, and a little bit too cold, a little bit too hot, and a little bit too cold, so it's well, not. Wait, it's yeah. like so how to regulate the heat? And I used the example of uh, if you're grilling in the summertime, if you use charcoal, if you use charcoal, you have to really eyeball it very well. If you put too much, it's gonna be too high for heat. If you put too little, it's not gonna cook. Again, it's better to weigh it. It's uh, exactly how much you're putting in. It requires some experience, but uh, for a for a grill, uh, propane and charcoal. So think about it. If you put too much charcoal, you're gonna have too much heat. Your burger's going to be burnt. And if you put too little, it's not going to cook. In the middle of the 
of uh, cooking the, the, the cold diet out on you. Meanwhile, if you use propane, and propane accessories, if you use propane, uh, I don't know, I used to get, get printed in my head, I have to say that. Propane and propane accessories. So propane, you can turn it on and heat the grill, because that's what you need for, for cooking the meat. Then when you put in the grill, uh, the, the food, you'll, you can turn it down. So it's easier to manipulate, easier to adjust. Uh, people who are fanatic about charcoal, actually they came up with a new grill that actually can, you can put a lot of coal, and it, it changed elevation, the distance. Wow. Yes, that was, that was, that was, that that control how much it's conducting through it because that's no, it's, it's the distance. Yeah, I checked it out. So, uh, guys, startup is also uh, another issue with uh, coal. We have to sometimes pulverize it to be able to burn it correctly. And uh, probably, again, if you grill with charcoal, if you don't have bladder fluid or something to, to get it started, it's a little bit. It takes a lot of time, so that's uh, not really easy. Cycling is not feasible. Usually you put some and you wait for it to finish, then you put some more. You just have to keep adding fuel. So cycling is not feasible. So diesel, that's what we use now. It's uh, basically diesel fuel. Fuel oil is diesel. It's the same diesel you use for your truck. Just different uh, color and the properties are completely the same. It has around 138,000 BTU per gallon. And uh, if you want to have a comparison, one gallon is about 70.5 pounds. So if we want to compare that to coal, pound per pound, we have BTU, is yes, not BTU, we have 18,000 BTU per pound. So coal is still harder than uh, diesel, the amount of heat it gives off. But uh, again, uh, so diesel, these also have the same property as uh, peanut oil. So you can use peanut oil for heat if you want to. And uh, the story goes that uh, Rudolf Diesel, the guy who invented the fuel, he started a diesel engine. Uh, and he decided to run on peanut oil. So when uh, big oil wanted to keep using the engine, they had to manufacture and the petroleum-based fuel with the same specification as diesel oil, as uh, peanut oil, so it will run the engine. Uh, so in theory, you can buy a diesel engine car and put peanut oil in it and run it, but it's gonna cost you a lot because the peanut oil is not cheap, it's expensive. Uh, you can also use frying oil, canola oil, same property. So if you think about it, it's really hard to get oil to catch on fire, right? So same thing with diesel. You have to do two things. Uh, you have to atomize it, small uh, particles, and you also have to make it reach a certain temperature, which is 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So the problem with people who try to fry turkey in the Thanksgiving <laughs> is what happens? The cooking temperature, what is the cooking temperature for uh, peanut oil? 170. What is the flash point for diesel oil? 165. So when you cooking your turkey, you also reach a flash point. So the oil is ready to flash. You can cook your turkey in diesel. If you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like that taste? It'll taste like a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like the taste of dinosaur? Yeah, some people love that. <laughs> Fine, one second. Uh, again, the last thing is wood pellets. You can use wood pellets also as a secondary heating source. Uh, it's very efficient now, it's not the way it used to be. You can buy, let's say you have an addition, like a new living room or a sunroom that you want to heat, you can buy a wooden stove, and uh, that's something that you're going to heat, uh, you're not going to heat regularly, and burn wood stove, uh, burn wood. And uh, the key point is you don't want the wood to smoke. When you have smoke, that means you're not burning the material completely, there are particles flowing, uh, and that's why you want to burn it. And it's very cheap now to get a bag of wood, wood uh, pellets, because the demand is low. If everybody uses wood pellets, then it's going to be very expensive. Yeah. And sometimes they run out. When it gets to your coat, it's, you run out. You cannot find any. So you cannot count on it. Uh, natural gas? Always gets delivered. Unless you pay the bill. 20, that, even if you don't pay the, pay the bill. But, but, no, it's the law. They can't cut off the gas.
I pay my bills, don't worry about that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it cannot, the by law, they cannot cut off the gas. So it's 20,000 BTU per gallon, if you want to put it in the gallon, liquefy it. And uh, when you go and look at your bill, what do they bill you with? Something called therm. What's a therm? 100,000 BTU. Because depending on what kind of blend they have at that day. Okay, I'll stop now and finish the material on 130. Can hit the.